Okay, uh, l ladies and gentlemen, let's get um, started. Welcome to se special session F. Um, my name is Jonathan Haskell. Uh, I have the honour to chair this session, but in bad circumstances, I'm afraid, because Mary O'Mahony, uh, who would have been a much better chair, uh, has been taken ill and is not well, so I'm stepping in for her. So I'm sure everybody wishes Mary um, well. Um, so uh, I'm going to do the honours and open the session. We've got three papers. Uh, I'm going to start. Matthew Agarala is uh, there, and he's going to come next. Uh, and Bridget Coma uh, is uh, over there, and she's going to come after that. Um, I'm going to be, we started a little bit late, but I'm going to end at quarter past uh, in order to give us uh, the right amount of time. Um, so the first uh, paper, if I can get this up in the slides, which is this here, and if I press this button here. Hopefully this works. Uh, so the first paper um, is about uh, a new database uh, and this is joint work with Carol Corrado, her, who everybody knows, uh, who's currently in the US, Massimiliano Iomi, uh, Cecilia Yonalacino, who's sitting here at the front, and Filippo Bontadini, who's also sitting here uh, at the front. Uh, Filippo and Cecilia have, of course, all done all the hard work, uh, and uh, so I'm not quite sure why I'm, I'm talking about this, but um, there we are. I'm happy to be uh, here. Uh, so what is this data? This is the latest um, incarnation of the EU CLEMS. Um, Mary, of course, uh, was uh, instrumental in doing that, along with Bart van Ark and various other people. Uh, so those of you with long memories will remember downloading the wonderful EU CLEMS data on the left-hand side. Uh, Robert Sterer uh, from uh, Austria uh, worked on an update of that. Uh, and so this is an update of that. It's over on the right-hand side there as well. There's the link. If you click on that link, there. You can download all the data. Filippo has set it all up. You can press one button and it all comes down to you in Stata or Excel or whatever it might be. So he's done a wonderful job uh, of doing all of that. Uh, so that's the link. That's what the database looks like. Uh, and I should acknowledge, of course, the support of uh, DG ECFIN uh, very generously. Uh, what does the data do? You'll be familiar with the EU CLEMS, but there's a sort of second aspect to the EU CLEMS, which um, is this. Um, there's a statistical side to it and there's an analytical side to it. For those of you who don't know anything about this uh, at all, you should go, if I go down to uh, this row here, the third row here, you should think of this essentially being a productivity accounting database, which is a mix of the national accounts, uh, labour inputs and capital inputs. That's essentially how this database works. Um, the, for, on this left-hand side, we take national accounts measures of output and of capital and of uh, uh, and of labour, uh, and those are off, those are the official uh, capital kind of measures. On the right hand side, um, we've built our own capital stocks. Again, this is an EU CLEM style using the perpetual inventory method, uh, and we call that the um, analytical side um, as well. So all of that is consistent with consistent rates of return, uh, which add up to uh, profits and so forth. So um, I should, of course, say that this is all entirely Jorgensen and Grillikis uh, kind of work uh, as well. It's entirely in that spirit and using um, that method. Um, so what kind of data would you find uh, on this database? Uh, again, for those of you who are familiar with this, um, you'll be aware of this, but for those of you who are not, so as you can see on the left-hand side here, a gross value added output, there's some data on intermediate inputs, employment, uh, labor compensation, uh, adjusted for mixed income and so forth. On the labor side, you can see the different labor sides. There are different labor types. Uh, on the capital side is investment in official national account stocks by asset. Um, on the analytical side, uh, those uh, national accounts uh, stocks uh, are from um, the perpetual inventory uh, method as well, and they're all harmonized uh, with various um, uh, 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 um, various deflators, uh, one of which is mentioned there, the harmonized ICT deflator. The productivity levels data set is over on the right here. I'm looking at Filippo here. That's not quite released yet. Is that right, Filippo? Uh, I'm sorry? Coming. coming soon. Coming soon. For those who didn't hear that, uh, coming soon is the good news uh, with, uh, for that um, as well. Um, I should say um, uh, on the bottom right here, as it says, there's an extended growth accounting, including bottom-up calculations. What does a bottom-up calculation mean? That means calculating labour productivity by aggregating all the different industries and getting an aggregate. That turns out to be a little bit different to the top-down aggregate measure of labour productivity because of labour reallocation. And I'll be saying something about that uh, in just a second. Um, here, are the, here is the coverage. 
It's as many EU countries as we can do, 27 EU countries. The US uh, is provided for as well, with thanks to Carol Corrado. Uh, the UK uh, and Japan as well, uh, with thanks to our Japanese partners. Uh, our various partners are listed uh, here as well. I should mention Matilda Mass, who's a friend of uh, many people uh, in this conference, uh, who's done all the work um, for Spain. Um, here, are the various, uh, here, here are the various sources here as well. A combination of Eurostat, the OECD and the ONS, uh, and the BEA, uh, and the VLS uh, for e uh, uh, and the BLS. Um, what's the time frame? 1995 to 2020. Um, it's been a big effort, as you can imagine, to get the data up that recently. Statistical offices take a long time to release their data for entirely understandable reasons, uh, and we're working on an update uh, uh, of the data um, as well. Um, so I hope that's informative uh, about it. Um, what features of this, uh, and these are up on the screen uh, for you. Um, so there are lots of different industries here, including industries M and N, uh, including industries Q86 and Q87 to Q88. Filippo, I have forgotten what Q86 Health, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, what they are. Um, uh, and then there's an aggregation that we do, which is the market sector excluding agriculture. Does that exclude the real estate industry as well? That excludes the real estate industry as well. Um, this is deep in the weeds, so forgive me for those of you who aren't interested. You'll know that the real estate industry, from a kind of accounting point of view, is a troublesome industry. There's lots of capital in the real estate industry, which is dwellings, uh, which is a little bit annoying if we're trying to do business capital uh, formation. Uh, so you can, t you, Filippo has already taken the real estate industry out to this sector called market ex agriculture or you can take it out yourself, because all the different industries are all there. We also have industries, uh, Filippo, again, will correct me if I'm wrong, within manufacturing, isn't that right, as well? So there's a little bit of within manufacturing breakdown as well, which I think is kind of helpful, uh, especially lots of people at this conference are worrying about the ICT industry and dynamism and all that kind of thing, uh, as we've heard from um, Javier uh, Miranda just um, now. Um, uh, industry uh, de detail, um, uh, uh, so there's in TAN Invest uh, information for 15 industries uh, in the market sector. Let me just pause a moment uh, and say what that means. Uh, you'll be aware that over the years, increasingly, statistical offices have capitalised intangible capital, the kind of intangible capital that uh, Matchlup worked on in the 1950s, uh, that Len, uh, Len Nakamura, uh, who was here uh, and is, not, uh, and, 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 uh, is around, uh, has worked on, and Corrado Holden and Sickle uh, worked on as well. So we've, uh, national statistical agencies have been capitalizing those intangibles. What this uh, um, uh, version of CLEMS does is it takes in all of the Corrado Holds and Sickle intangibles, uh, capitalizes them, and works them through uh, all of the accounts. So all of that is available for you, uh, again, by industry, by asset, uh, and it's all downloadable, uh, as I mentioned. Um, we mentioned also a breakdown for the manufacturing sector as well. Um, the asset coverage includes the own account component of branding and design, uh, and uh, there's lots of documentation which tells you all about it. Um, we hope we've got some better deflators for non-national account uh, uh, intangibles, uh, some value-added deflators, um, and we've aligned some service sector uh, output deflators as well. Uh, and there's some new method for some of the own account components of intangibles as well. And I should mention we've also got harmonized ICT asset prices as well. This was a major feature uh, of the previous EU claims, and so we've built on the work uh, that people ha have done on that too. Um, let me, in the time available, just quickly tell you about some findings. To, and or this will, also, this will give you some sense about what kind of, product, uh, what kind of data is available. So here's a panel of productivity growth. So this is just, well, this, has got, this is value added per hour, intangibles uh, uh, included as well. Um, we've got lots of countries. You can see the years along the bottom there, mid-1990s up to 2020. What can you see? Uh, let's go over to the right. The EU North is a group of countries roughly in the north of the EU. You can see that the level of productivity has slowed. Let's go to the bottom left, the EU South, roughly the Mediterranean countries. The level of productivity, sorry, productivity growth, I say level of productivity, forgive me. Productivity growth has not slowed, but that's because productivity growth was not particularly good, I'm sorry to say, uh, in those countries in advance of the financial crisis. Uh, and you can see the different areas. We've got the EU East, we've got the EU Centre, uh, and the UK, obviously not part of that, uh, and, the, and the US. Um, Japan, forgive me, is not on this um, slide. 
Um, so that'll give you a sense uh, of what it is, uh, the kind of thing you can do with the data set. Um, these are bottom-up uh, estimates. Uh, so that is to say they aggregate every single industry. Uh, and this is the, indus the, whole, this is the, the classification I was telling you about. It's the whole economy, excluding agriculture, excluding real estate, and in this version, excluding health uh, and education. But again, the data is there uh, if you want to play around with it. Um, the share of intangibles uh, is going up. The black line is the intangible share. The sort of orangey mustard colored line is the tangible share. There's intangibles and there's, uh, sorry, national accounts intangibles and non national accounts intangibles as well. Um, so there's some, uh, a word about that. Um, just in terms of what we find, we do some reallocation work. I mentioned this a little bit earlier on, so let me just pop it up on the slide for you. Um, so here's uh, labor productivity growth for the whole economy, which is um, the output, uh, the, the change in output. Uh, and uh, let's sum up all the different hours. That would be whole economy growth. Um, that's equal to a value-added share-weighted sum of output per hour growth in every industry, plus the reallocation of hours between high and low productivity industries. And that's what this uh, little equation here tells you. So an immediate question one can answer is, is productivity growth, or the slowdown in productivity growth, is it because of these within industry effects or is it because of this reallocation effect? So maybe it's the case that productivity has slowed down after the financial crisis because there's less of this reallocation going on. Now, when I say reallocation, this is between the different industries that we have in the database. Javier Miranda, uh, who gave a talk here just a, a second ago, of course, was, de oh, there's Javier over there, uh, was dealing, of course, with all the micro data within the different industries. So we're much more aggregated uh, than what Javier is doing. Um, but just to give you a sense of that, uh, here's a graph of reallocation. Uh, again, <coughs> EU center, EU east, and, and the north, and so forth. And there are two things to take away from this graph. The, the first thing is most of the points are around zero. And that turns out to be, uh, be the answer, which is at least at this level, reallocation isn't doing very much. The second point is you can see that in 2020, you might think, oh, isn't that a massive outlier? Well, of course, that's the COVID effect. And that tells you that actually a lot of the productivity growth over COVID, I say, the first, I say COVID, in 2020, so the first year of COVID, a lot of that productivity growth was indeed powered by this kind of uh, inter-industry reallocation. I suspect that when we get 2021, we will find a lot of that will go away, depending upon the different uh, uh, um, uh, COVID analysis there would be. So this data set is not quite yet ready to do kind of definitive COVID type analysis. You'll need you know, quarterly data and more up-to-date data and all that kind of thing. But I think it's pointing towards where that, the COVID and productivity type uh, analysis uh, might go. Um, and here finally is a bar chart um, which gives you the reallocation effects. Uh, so aggregate labor productivity is on the left, the left cluster of bars. The reallocation effects are on the right, the right cluster of bars. And what you can see essentially is those, so, so Nick Holton has got his hand like this because he's having, struggle, he's struggling to see. And Nick is right to be struggling to see. Nick is normally right on everything. He's particularly right to be struggling to see because most of these reallocation bars, <coughs> excuse me, are around zero, except for 2020, uh, which as I mentioned is very high as well. So again, it gives you some sense that there's something special uh, about uh, 2020 going on. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the growth accounting information. Uh, what kind of growth accounting information can we do? Uh, so here's a table again across three different aggregations, the EU, the UK, <coughs> and the US. Labor productivity is on the left. The labor contribution is rather small. The tangibles contribution is there. The intangibles contribution and the TFP contribution. And again, forgive me for going quickly. These are a little bit hard to see. You can see the big negative lines in 2020, that final uh, 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 column on the right there, again tells you that there's lots of stuff going on 2020. So if I take 2020 or away, uh, away, it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, if, I th if I go to the US, for example, I can see the decline in labor productivity pre and post financial crisis here. Uh, a fair amount of that is accounted for by TFP, but there's been a big slowdown in tangible investment uh, per hour uh, in the US as well. Um, so one can play around with these, two, with, with these different things. One thing which I think is helpful in regard of the EU CLEMS is that because we've got a fair amount of data after the financial crisis, 
one can sort of separate out the financial crisis years. So in particular here, I've taken 2008 to 2010 and split it up into different ways. I think that's kind of helpful. I think earlier versions, understandably, of CLEMS, one had to include the financial crisis years, which were in some ways um, somewhat exceptional. I'm, I'm kind of beyond, uh, going beyond time, so again, more tables of what you can do. Uh, let me just show you a quick plot <coughs> here, uh, and then two quick regressions. So this is a plot <coughs> of total factor productivity growth uh, on this axis against intangible capital services growth on this axis um, as well. Uh, each point is a country, so here, for example, is Spain, uh, and this is Spain before the financial crisis, uh, and there's Spain... Um, ba, 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 during the financial crisis uh, and Spain will be somewhere over here after the financial crisis in green. So again, one can look at these different things. Uh, and what do you see? You see a positive correlation between uh, TFP and intangible capital services growth, which is in line with the idea, uh, again, going back to Gorilla Keys, in line with the idea that there might be spillovers from um, intangibles. Two more quick things. Uh, one is... We've won a regression, essentially, of what of the uh, diagram you've just seen, where we regress TFP growth in country C at time T on the intangibles. This is the national accounts intangibles and the non-national accounts intangibles, plus various, to see if there are spillovers or evidence consistent with spillovers, plus various interaction effects. And here's an interaction effect post-20, a dummy post-2010. And interestingly, what you get over on the right-hand side is this is you get a positive uh, correlation between uh, actually lagged intangibles and TFP. Uh, but then if you insert a dummy for post-financial crisis, you see that that uh, coefficient has gone down quite a lot. So that is consistent with the notion that these spillover effects have got less. Um, finally, um, we've got some Phillips curves uh, work here as well. So this is the growth uh, in, um, uh, in inflation, on lagged inflation, uh, and the output gap interacted with two variables, trade and with intangibles. And it turns out that with trade, one flattens the Phillips curve. This is the, uh, uh, the estimate here. And intangibles seem to flatten the Phillips curve as well. So on the macro side, there's lots of interest uh, in all of that. Right. Um, I am going to, uh, I had some spares, which I'm not going to go to. Um, so I'm going to stop uh, and I'm happy to invite any, any questions uh, in the last few minutes, uh, and then I can pass over to Matthew. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Uh, Bernard. Could, Bernard, forgive me, could you wait for the mic? Because we're live streaming this, uh, and uh, so people at home can hear. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was very interesting, and I'm jolly glad I woke up in time to come here. Um, you kept on, in your diagrams, you kept on taking out things like health and education, which I am terribly interested in. Um, and I wondered whether, there, you, whether you've picked up any observations about what is going on in those sectors, sectors which we've talked about quite a lot in the last couple of days. Thank yeah. You. Um, thanks, Bernard. Uh, very good question. They're not on these diagrams, just to keep them thinking. The bottom line is they are all in the data, so one can do what one wants to do in the data. Um, personally, I don't feel I've worked enough on those sectors, and they're incredibly interesting sectors. They are not least sectors where you'd think ICT would have a potentially massive effect on the health side, um, so we should probably do some more work on that. Since Javi is down here, I can ask him. Javi, the, 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 the dynamism question, um, results and so forth you were showing, that included health and education and so forth, did it? Uh, those are messy sectors. <laughs> uh, those are messy sectors. Uh, so um, uh, the private parts of it right. are covered by the U.S. data. The non-private parts of it are not. Covered. Are not covered. So okay. it's uh, it's difficult, like you say. Okay. So Bernard, thanks for the question, but there's plenty of work to be done there, I think. At, at the back, uh, and then and then Nick. Lots of gymnastic. Um, th thanks a lot, um, John, and thanks for this amazing service, because we all use this, well, we all not all use this data. I use this data, so thanks a lot. Um, my question is always about the harmonization of the different statistical offices of some of these measures. So what do they include in intangibles? What do not include in intangibles? What do they include in, in specific capitals, such as IT, CT, 
uh, the rest of capital. So how how is it going in terms of harmonizing those figures across different statistical offices across different countries so that we can when we do cross country comparison we are the more aware um filippo is probably best placed to answer that argument but the poor lady would have to come and sprint down here with the microphone um so let me try to answer that but please hook up with filippo um so we harmonize the ict deflators as have been done in other eu claims so that uh, EU claims, so that is harmonized uh, other, uh, in terms of the um, national account, uh, sorry, the intangibles, uh, especially the non-national accounts intangibles, that's the work that we've, that we as a project team have tried to do, and we've tried to harmonise that, and all the information is available for you. So that's not uh, uh, official statistical offices, but then the other, you know, statistical intangibles are taken from the uh, statistical agencies. So we treat their data um, as their data. Um, sorry, that's a very short answer to a complicated question which has taken a lot of hard work uh, by the people involved. Uh, there's documentation about it and happy to talk about it. Thanks. Nick. Uh, yes, uh, well, thanks very much for presenting this new data set to us, which is obviously going to be tremendously useful. Um, I just had a question about the years before 1995, because I myself have used EU CLEMS for the years before then. Um, and I'm just wondering, for example, in looking at things like slowdowns in TFP and when they start. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how easy it would be to could one splice on the earlier vintages of EU CLEMS, or would that not be advisable in your view? Well, I know Filippo has worked hard on sort of starting values and so forth for all of this, but I'm going to defer to him. I'm so sorry. Do you mind passing Filippo the microphone? Because that's an excellent question. Sorry. Thanks. Yes, I think, unfortunately, the answer, it wouldn't be that easy. Not for the main reason being, A, that the, uh, we work with the updated versions of all time series. So if you have a version, a time series from previous versions of UCLEMS that was using even national statistical offices numbers, it, the two might not necessarily speak to each other. So methodologically speaking, it wouldn't be particularly advisable. And to create estimates for those bringing back that would require a significant amount of work um, in making some estimations because the Eurostat certainly releases these days data from 95 onwards so you it would involve I, I would assume some conversations with Eurostat and the ONS I think if so in the US even sometimes 97 so from 95 to 97 we found a historical ver series of from the BA we could use to bring it two years back if, yeah, it would be uh, a bit of, of a tricky one, I would say, unfortunately. Um, M Maria had a question, uh, and then we're going to stop, I'm afraid. Sorry. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That, that is two really quick footnotes, and I have to say that I see Filippo Spain producing all these data, so I'm very sympathetic. Just to quickly, going back to education and health, I think another troublesome um, sector might be social and public services, which is at the end of the uh, score, and I wanted to see whether there's any particular um, outlier in this respect. And the other is related to the um, harmonization question, um, and I was wondering whether items in the intangible, such as IPR, or design vis-a-vis -vis organizational capital can be, they're very diverse, so they're probably affected by uh, proprietary regimes and regulations and something that um, it would be great to see whether, the way you take into account in terms of definitional boundaries and so on, which okay. would affect, for example, the cross-country comparisons, I assume, I don't know, right. it'd be great to know. No, no, th th thanks very much, Maria. And, and I think the short answer to that excellent question is we've got lots of documentation which explains all of that uh, stuff. But, you, you know, you're right, to, uh, you're right to point that out. As far as sort of health and social care and so forth are concerned, again, we're reliant on the statistical offices uh, uh, for, for, the work, for the work that they're doing there. Um, right, I, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to intrude on Matthew's hand. Thank you again very much indeed. Um, and let's... Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Matthew, I'm at the University of Cambridge, I'm at the Productivity Institute, I'm at Yale University. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is about environmentally adjusted productivity measures. We're focusing here on the UK. Um, 
I come from the world of natural capital accounting, inclusive wealth accounting, uh, and in that field, we've often operated on the assumption that if we build it, then they will come. Uh, but the reality is that we've started to build it, and in the UK, we've actually delivered it, and they didn't come. Uh, so the next step for those of us who are interested in natural capital is to try and figure out, well, how can we use these statistics and this, this information to shed light on mainstream economic questions? Uh, and so that's what we try to do, I think, in this paper. Um, we had a, a brilliant economist in Cambridge uh, named uh, Jim Murleys, Professor Sir James Murleys. And in 1996, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. And in the acceptance speech, uh, he noted that the first rule in economic research is to find a good co-author. Uh, and that's what I did. <laughs> so this is work that is co-authored with Josh Martin um, at the Bank of England uh, and at ESCO. Um, I should make uh, it very clear that this research does not reflect the views of the Bank of England, the Monetary Policy Committee, any of its committees, or that of the Office of National Statistics. Any mistakes uh, are our own. Um, so where do we start? Well, we start with the fact that productivity in, in many senses is actually really, really simple. We're just talking about outputs per inputs. Uh, but the way that we've tended to measure this um, is really from a private goods or a private markets perspective. Uh, that is, we have allowed the assumption of the free disposal of bad outputs. So if the production process generates pollution, we can ignore the pollution because it's not a marketable output. Well, in a post Dasgupta world or for an environmental economist, that's increasingly problematic. And so we're trying to think about ways that we might want to incorporate those externalities into productivity measures. Uh, and for simplicity and because the data allows us, we uh, speak specifically in this paper about gross value added and largely about hours worked when we're talking about labor productivity. But we do have some work on energy and emissions productivity as well. And what's really exciting about doing this in a country like the UK is that our brilliant colleagues at the ONS um, have provided uh, data at such a, a high level of uh, sectoral detail. So that's really quite exciting. So we're contextualizing this against the productivity puzzle, against our policy objectives to drive towards net zero, uh, against the public context of changing living standards, often not for the best. Uh, and so we want research in uh, natural capital and in productivity to be able to try to address all three. Uh, you will all be very familiar with the slowdown uh, in productivity growth that we've experienced. Um, and this is just trying to show what, what that looks like. Um, we're now up to something like uh, 25 to 30% shortfall in output uh, per worker, uh, which is substantial. Um, so how do we bring in the, the environmental story here? Well, let's look at where we've been. So we're going to start with data from 1970 and, and, and come towards today. Um, since then, GDP has grown substantially in the UK. Um, but emissions, actually energy consumption has not grown. Um, the volume of energy uh, consumption has essentially been flatlined across that. And emissions, in fact, have fallen. So it, we're showing you from 1970, but even if we took from 1990, we'd be talking about an 80% increase in output with about a 50% reduction in emissions. So this is what the degrowth uh, uh, contingent tells us is not possible to achieve. You cannot have an absolute reduction in emissions whilst you have uh, growth. The UK suggests otherwise. Now, some of this is due to energy productivity gains. We're just getting better at turning energy into GDP. And some of it is because we are greening our sources of energy. And you can see the relative sizes of this. Um, all the green crap, the, the, the green energy investments, it hasn't actually uh, done that much uh, compared to the increase in energy productivity growth. So what I think that means is there's huge scope to continue on greening the energy system. And that will help us reduce the emissions really substantially. So output per input. Let's think about some variations on this theme. How, how might we adjust this to try to reflect some of uh, the natural capital, the carbon emissions, the pollutant emissions, and the various investments that firms are making in order to reduce those environmental bads? 
Well, one thing we might want to do is think about how there may be an unmeasured output that adds value to society, but not necessarily uh, captured in, in a market output. If, I'm, if I have a production factory uh, and I invest money in new scrubbers, new machines, new factories, I decarbonize the fleet of vehicles, I've invested substantially in my capital stock, and the output is improved environmental quality for which I cannot charge. And so maybe we have a missing output that would make the GBA look larger if we were reflecting that in our accounts. Alternatively, we could think about there being a missing environmental bad. I pollute. We, in this paper, we deduct the value of that pollution from the value added, and that gives us our GVA minus. And we take a couple of others uh, that we look at as well. We look at energy productivity, and we look at emissions productivity. Uh, how effectively do we turn carbon emissions into GDP? So what's the uh, carbon intensity of output, for instance? So now I'm going to look at GVA and energy. So we're talking about an energy productivity measure. And of course, the first question that always comes up when we start to talk about this story is, well, clearly, we've just shifted. We no longer manufacture heavy stuff. We now produce lightweight services. And because of that, we're not uh, emitting the carbon. Well, it turns out that actually the vast majority of the improvements in energy productivity are within industries rather than this shift story. And that holds across a few different um, aggregations. We do six sectors, 10 sectors, 42 sectors, um, et cetera. So we are about twice as efficient in using energy as we were uh, th 30 years ago. Uh, and yeah, it's mostly a within effect, although there is some between effect as well. Ah, sorry, I meant to do the exam question now. This is the audience participation uh, part of, of, of today. Uh, and I apologize that that comes on day three of, of the uh, conference. Um, which sectors do we think will have decarbonized the most? I'm going to give you two categories. Uh, it's going to be either the most energy intensive or the least energy intensive. Which ones do we assume, do we think, have decarbonized the most? Energy intensive firms? Raise hands. OK. Least energy intensive firms? All right. So I'm with you. I, I assume that the most energy intensive firms will have decarbonized the most. Um, but working with Josh, we learned we don't have to assume. We can just know some things. Um, and what we know is that actually there's no real correlation um, between energy intensity and uh, the growth of energy productivity. I would have expected something very, very different. I did expect something very different. Um, but this is the advantage of working with somebody who knows the data inside out like, like Josh does. Uh, we can start to reveal these unexpected uh, trends or lacks, lack of trends um, in, in the data. Uh, but we can also, because we have it down by sectors, we can take a look at which ones have uh, 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 reduced the energy intensity the most. Um, and so rail transport, water transport, even air transport, uh, the things that I would have thought are amongst the most difficult to decarbonize have done the best. Whereas road transport, postal and courier, the places where it would be easiest to decarbonize and, and reduce the energy intensity have done the least. Uh, which suggests to me, I don't know, maybe there's a policy concern here. There's a way that we could accelerate um, the energy efficiency gains in these industries if we wanted. Now, I've been speaking a bit about energy, and we normally think about carbon emissions that come along with, with energy. Um, but there are loads of other pollutants into the atmosphere that really matter for somebody who's an environmental economist. And the, lar the biggest uh, effect here is that uh, Particulate emission, like PM 2.5, PM 10, uh, has a huge impact on human health. It has an impact on cognitive capacity. It has an impact on labor productivity. And so actually, even uh, more urgently than climate, this has an impact on the economy every single day. We know that test scores of students in London uh, suffer on high air pollution days versus low air pollution days. And that's not just London. But that study has been done around the world as well. Um, so we use some uh, values, government uh, values, uh, for the uh, concentrations. Uh, and we take a look at, well, what's happened over uh, uh, the past 30 years or so. 
So now we're on to the GVA minus, the GVA and emissions side. We used to emit tons of this stuff. I mean, really, a lot of it. And the impact on GVA minus, on our adjusted uh, uh, output measure, is negative, right? Because these are negative externalities, so we're subtracting the value. But as we've become more efficient, we've become more energy efficient, we've become more emissions efficient, uh, we've cleaned up, the negative value, the deduction each year, has been shrinking over time. I've been in environmental economics since 2010. Uh, this is the first time I've ever had a good news story in a paper. Um, so I'm really pleased about this. Uh, what it means is that when we adjust the productivity measures to reflect the environmental externalities and we look at that over time, the negative deduction is shrinking over time, which means the growth rate actually appears even better over time. So we could improve the reported productivity statistics for the UK overnight simply by following the, th the theme, the spirit of the Dasgupta review, and starting to incorporate some of the externalities. The problem is that we still have the slowdown. <laughs> um, so we haven't answered that question. We answered a different one, I think. Um, we can break this down by sector. And if you look at the, the paper, uh, I think we've gone for death by charts. So I don't know how many figures and charts, Josh, we have at the end, but it, 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 it's into the triple digits of, of figures. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but you can see that uh, the impact differs pretty substantially across different industries. There's, in fact, half a dozen industries or so uh, that when we do this, report negative GVA for the entire assessment period. Uh, so uh, agriculture, um, which are the others? Oil and uh, gas and mining. Um, there's half a dozen or so that are, it's negative GVA pretty much across the entire, uh, the entire period. So what does this mean? Well, we've done fairly well on improving the energy uh, productivity and the emissions productivity um, in the UK over the past quarter century and, and, and a bit. This is not something that can simply be explained by saying, well, we stopped producing heavy stuff and started producing ideas instead. Um, it, there are some places where we have persistently negative value added once we start to factor in some of the externalities. There's a caveat with that, though, which is that there may be positive externalities from some of those industries. So air transport, for instance, may have positive externalities because it helps us share ideas and culture uh, across borders. That's not factored in. Um, I think that. Uh, the, the conclusion here is that we can, we can boost what looks like uh, the productivity growth, but we still can't answer uh, the productivity puzzle question. Um, and I think we desperately need some more work to identify the environmental protection outputs and the various inputs that are being used uh, to generate those. Uh, that, that's a really exciting area. Um, I'd like us to do that uh, soon. Uh, it's really Josh that has to lead on that because he understands it better than I do. And the final thing is that the next paper we're going to be working on uh, is trying to take a look at, well, what is, what is all this getting us in terms of value? Uh, can we calculate, I think we can calculate, a decarbonization dividend? Right? So we've become more efficient in the way that we use emissions and energy. Imagine that we hadn't, but we still wanted to produce today's level of output. Well, that would cost us a lot more in energy inputs. We can calculate how much that would be. Don't quote me on this. Back of the envelope calculations um, are suggesting that, well, we might be in the order of magnitude of one to, or one and a half to two NHSs a year worth of savings. Um, but don't quote me on that. That's still work in progress. Uh, but I think an interesting way to communicate the benefits of the green crap. Uh, thank you. I think I'm happy to take questions. I'm, I'm nervous to take one from, from Nick Olton again. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, well, it was a very interesting paper. Thanks very much. Um, I just had a query about w we've had this improvement. And I is your sense that the improvement is due to firms responding to incentives like energy or something that you know they just found ways of saving on energy because it was in their interest to do so or was it due to uh, regulation i mean uh, it's quite important for f the future i mean we'd like to know how much we have to regulate more than we already do and how much we can rely on incentives it, it's a brilliant question i don't have an answer um i don't see an obvious break in the trend around, say, the 2008 Climate Change Act. Um, I wish I did, uh, but just eyeballing that is not the appropriate method. So I, I think that's going to require some uh, additional research. I think identifying the impact of any single piece of legislation in this area is going to be really tough. Um, I, econometrically, I'm, I'm not sure I'm up to it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. That that's. That's a hugely important question to be able to answer. Uh, we have a, a woman. Yeah, perfect. And then just in front. After. Hi, thank you very much. This is Michela Vecchi from Kingston University. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and very good news to see that we are getting better now at producing, uh, being more energy efficient. But. Um, what the data is telling us doesn't quite match with what we see in everyday life. You know, temperature has become more extreme. Summers are very hot in the UK. Italy currently is experiencing one of the worst floods ever. So is this a case that the statistics is telling a story, but everywhere else things are not quite that optimistic? Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing me back down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, uh, re again, a, re a really important question. Um, we focused here on the UK and we focused on the production account. So we're actually not even including the consumption, say, for, for home heating or for uh, personal transport. Um, so th that's an extension we need to make. Uh, another extension uh, that I hope would try to address your, your question is, well, can we make this a global analysis? Um, and I would want to do that in a multi-regional input-output model because while there are some countries like the UK and much of uh, Western Europe and North America that find this sort of falling emissions intensity of output, there are other countries in the middle income, rapidly industrializing countries where they're increasing over the assessment period by maybe 300%. Uh, percent. Um, so globally, it's different. And of course, climate is... Uh, the result of a uniformly mixing pollutant. And so emissions reductions here can be more than offset elsewhere. For the value of the PM10 and 2.5 emissions, the international story is not quite as important because those are sort of more locally uh, experienced pollutants. Um, but yeah, you're right. And I think there was a question just in front. Uh, it's going to come from... <laughs> um, thank you. That was interesting, Bernard Casey. Um, can I ask a again? This is sort of going a bit off context, but um, you presented an analysis which allowed you, in this particular case, to put prices on externalities, negative or positive, and you were actually able to do that. And you showed us how you did that. This issue of dealing with let's call them externalities, it's not specific to, let's say, sort of energy production or kind of uh, so, something like that. Externalities and apply if we are talking about productivity adjustments in a lot of other places. We discussed issues of quality, for instance, yesterday in the day. Those are the kind of things which are potentially also sort of are those externalities or are they something else? And what is more, it was relatively easy to price what you were talking about. But if I start to apply the same kind of analysis somewhere else, I possibly have a much more difficult task than you were able to have in the admittedly limited but uh, very precise way that you did it. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. We've started to incorporate some externalities, even if we stuck within the environmental sphere. We haven't incorporated externalities related to biodiversity loss, related to water quality or water scarcity. Uh, 
you know, so th there's lots we, we've not included here. Um, I think we are hoping that better is good. And if we can incorporate some of the externalities and do so in a credible way, that's an, Im an improvement. Uh, yeah, uh, in the front, please. Thanks. Um, I guess I was wondering how much of what you find is carbon leakage, that we are in the UK, production has got better, but maybe it's just China or Vietnam that are getting all the polluting bits of any sector. Do you have a sense of that? Um, I have a sense that it would dampen the magnitude of our results, but not adjust the trend or the, the sign, the, you know, the, the, uh, the direction. Um, if we look here, uh, the trend in the emissions, um, whether we're talking about uh, production or consumption based, is pretty much the same across a few different data sets. Um, we do see, we have in the paper actually the graph of the production, the consumption, uh, and the territorial based emissions as well. Um, so consumption based emissions have fallen over the assessment period, so they're moving in the same direction, but it's not as radical, it's not as drastic a, a change. Uh, the best way to properly answer that would be to put this into a multi-regional input-output model and check. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good comment that uh, we should do for the next piece. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, really interesting uh, piece. I was just wondering if there was a, a valuation story in this as well in terms of how you price the carbon whether that changes over time. And if, if it grows over time, then you can have a very, very different productivity story, I suspect. Uh, there should be a valuation story in this paper. There isn't really. Uh, what we use um, for, uh, well, for, for a variety of reasons is just the UK official government numbers for valuing carbon and for valuing uh, these pollutant emissions. Uh, Published, peer-reviewed published estimates of the social cost of carbon range from about minus $6 per ton to about $4,500 per ton. So you, you can pick pretty much anything you want there. We use the UK government number. Um, and, and the same for the particulate emissions. More work needs to be done on valuing those, uh, updating those. There's a dose response issue around the PM10, PM2.5 uh, that I don't think we capture in this very well. Uh, we could extend it with more valuation, but we, basically we wanted to show what have we got now in natural capital stats? Can we use that on a mainstream economics question? And does it tell us something we didn't already know about the world? And we think, yes. Um. Matthew, I, I've got a question online. Uh, I'll say it loudly and perhaps you could repeat it. From Robert and, and Brentway, who asks, what are the barriers to the ONS incorporating environmental adjustments in their reporting of, of labor productivity? <laughs> um, Could you just repeat the question? Yeah. Just for so, thank questions. you very much. There's a question that came online from Robert. What are the barriers to the ONS uh, making these adjustments in its uh, labor productivity uh, assessments? Um, I don't speak for the ONS. Uh, I don't know. I think it's probably a bit undercooked to just take our results and, and adjust UK labor productivity data. Um, I think we're experimenting at the moment. Uh, I have tremendous respect for the ONS. I think if we can demonstrate this with a theoretical model, do a few more empirical studies, and, and make a case that this actually improves our understanding of the economy, I think they'd be receptive. Uh, yeah, d d how am I doing on time? OK, we've got a couple of minutes. <coughs> Uh, thank you so much. Very interesting and insightful presentation. Uh, just want your views on fracking. Um, we all know that it, in terms of uh, states, we have clear evidence of the economic benefits, but there are clear dangers to environment and health. So how does the analysis account for fracking, and do we have some information and your views on that? Thank you very much. Um, that's a, a bit off topic for this paper, but I, do, uh, I did do some work um, in some diplomatic exchanges between the UK and uh, the State Department uh, on specifically the economics of uh, unconventional hydrocarbons, so fracking. Um, to the extent that it's fracking for gas and that's displacing dirtier coal, there's a carbon benefit. Um, in the communities where this takes place, uh, 
what you tend to have, it tends to be rural. Every, most of the US is rural, right? It's not like the, the, the UK at all. Um, you have tiny communities. They see a huge spike in uh, job opportunities. You get lots of people who come in. They earn really high wages. Uh, they take all of that money out with them. They price the local people out. Uh, the, the, the social impacts on the local communities are pretty, pretty poor in, in, in most cases. Um, fracking in the UK, we don't have the space for it. Right? The entirety of the United Kingdom would fit comfortably inside New York State. New York State's not even one of the top 15 biggest US states. Uh, there's a seismic concern, um, so I, I think it's not, not, a go, not a good option for the UK. And here, it would displace renewables rather than coal, as it does in the US. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dan Mawson, I was Bayes. I'm now uh, Business and Trade. Um, on the plus side, I can say we have been using this internally to start making the case about how net zero is relevant to the productivity store, and it's not a sort of a degrowth kind of um, situation, actually. The kind of interventions we're doing are good for productivity as well. Um, I'll throw one of my colleagues, I think she's hiding at home today. Um, we're starting to look at this at a microdata level, looking at things like what can you do at the firm level to sort of extend this. So we're starting simply just looking at energy efficiency and productivity. What scope do you think there is to do more of this type of work at the firm level to kind of give the story that <coughs> if you invest in this kind of energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, you get productivity gains as well, in addition to the nice spillovers which society wants more broadly? Um. I might ask Josh to come in and, and help me on this one to, to some degree. Uh, my initial thought would be if firms are investing capital, that's a real outlay today. And if what they're giving is a public benefit in improved environmental outcomes, they're not getting a corresponding output. So it looks like the denominator is rising, the numerator is staying the same, it looks like less productivity. Um, I think we need to reward companies for um, their investments. Uh, I think we need to support it, but I'm going to ask Josh if he has further thoughts. No, th thanks very much. I'm delighted to hear the work's being used. Um, Matthew's right, and I don't think we have the sort of firm level data on a, a lot of these important concepts to, to make much headway here. So energy usage, yes, uh, to a sort of limited degree. Emissions, certainly not at the firm level, with, you know, with the exceptions of where the firm themselves goes out and sort of estimates this, but not in any sort of official database. Um, which would uh, make applying a lot of these sort of concepts quite difficult. We've worked with entirely aggregate sort of industry data, so it wouldn't be directly applicable. Um, but as Matthew says, I think we should reflect on whether we should be, uh, in, in your words, rewarding businesses for making these sorts of investments. Yes, it's, it, it's more sort of capital investment, so it's more input, but they are generating a sort of social output in, in the sense of not, not polluting. Um, so if they, we, we, we've tried to make some efforts to measure that at the aggregate level, maybe we could also make some efforts, uh, efforts to measure that at the firm level. Thanks. Perfect. I think we are at our time. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. And good morning, afternoon, everyone. Yeah, and um, it's joint work with Jordan Mion, and he's now at the ESSEC uh, Business School in Paris and also the University of uh, Nottingham. Um, as you can see, this is very, the results that we have or the work that we're doing is very preliminary it's in, in, it's in its infant stage. Uh, a big chunk of the time has been spent in trying to put the data set together and making it fit for purpose. So uh, we, I'm just going to show you some of the results that we've so far gotten uh, from uh, using the data set that we have uh, assembled. All right, just, well, I'm speaking to the converted, so I mean, it's just to say that, uh, well, productivity quantifies how efficiently uh, an economy uses its resources, so essentially just transforming uh, inputs into uh, outputs. And what is um, more important, perhaps, as a motivation on our part, is that, you know, we want, we believe that productivity is probably uh, for the UK and uh, especially now in the post-Brexit and post-COVID uh, times, probably the only source of uh, sustainable long-term uh, long economic growth. And also to see that, you know, as an 
economic activity, and just like most economic activities really, we see that you know, there's a special uh, dimension to productivity and there's heterogeneity in terms of the distribution of um, productivity across space within uh, the UK. And what we pick up from the analysis is that you know, there's a very big gap in terms of where London stands relative to the rest of uh, the regions in the UK. And in some cases, this, this gap is really to a factor of two. And we know that it's not only perhaps just productivity, but also other measures of uh, well-being like employment and uh, you know, material deprivation. And in um, separate but related work that we've done for France, we also uh, pick up uh, the same picture. So we have also assembled an equally uh, administrative longitudinal data for France, and we've done some analysis, just like some basic analysis like we've done for the UK, and we also uh, pick up uh, the same picture. So just on, uh, briefly on, uh, on the literature on urban um, economics, in terms of uh, where we, you know, we're getting the, the motivation for this is for first from the work of uh, Durantoni and Pilger on the rationalization really on how density affects uh, productivity. And this is based on you know, learning, matching, sharing, and, uh, and sorting. And also the work of Combs in terms of how they have summarized uh, the elasticity of productivity with respect to uh, density, that it's in the ranges of 0 0.02 and uh, between 0 0.02 and uh, 0 0.1. And of course, that you know, in terms of the results, these are robust to uh, endogeneity of current uh, density and also in particular to using long lags uh, in historical as instruments for the current level of density uh, in the literature. So where do we come in? So our contribution really is in terms of how we undertake the analysis, considering that for most geographers, the unit of analysis is usually a region. And for most economists now, is, you know, the unit of analysis is at the micro level has become firms and even going down to the level of uh, establishment and seeing uh, the performances across uh, space. But what we have seen is that when you use regions and when you use, um, when you use uh, establishments of firms, the results that you get are slightly different in terms of uh, the return of uh, productivity, I mean, of density to uh, productivity. So we have seen that uh, a study that was done by uh, Jacob and Mion in, in 2020 for France, again, uh, just looking at manufacturing, shows that there are these differences when you aggregate from the micro, which is the firm, to the macro, which is like uh, 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 the region. So what we try and do in this data set is to go beyond the manufacturing. So we assemble um, a longitudinal administrative data set for the UK covering, well, a population of firms that are registered for uh, VAT and at least pay one employee uh, on the payee. And we want to investigate these differences that when you aggregate from the micro uh, to the macro, you get a different value in terms of uh, the elasticity of productivity with respect to uh, density. So our focus is on uh, the return of uh, density and productivity. So we see that, you know, like I was saying, in going from the micro uh, to the macro, one of the things that you have to do is to wait. So when you run a regression, uh, at the regional level, you use weights. Typically, like in our case, we were using employment weights uh, to apportion uh, the, the contribution of individual firms within uh, a region. So the share of each individual firm within a given, uh, a given region. And what we find is that there are two potential outcomes um, that could lead to the differences in why you get a different uh, coefficient of the elasticity of density um, is that one of them is that the correlation between uh, productivity and firm size within the region varies. So if you have, for example, if in a denser region, um, it is characterized by a high correlation between firm size and firm productivity, when you apply weights, then you actually magnify these differences that exist at the micro level. So the macro, uh, the regional level, magnifies this effect. The other reason could be that there is heterogeneity in the distribution of production uh, of, of productivity across the productivity uh, line with respect to, to density. So j naturally, firms that are more productive might enjoy or might have a disproportionately, um, if they might disproportionately uh, enjoy uh, the benefits of economic uh, uh, aggregation. So at the regional level, if a firm is more productive, 
it might disproportionately benefit more from the uh, density of economic activities. And if you weigh that, then you're also going to be picking up or magnifying these effects. And of course, naturally, most firms that are productive are on average also fairly uh, large. So if you weigh, then you're also picking up uh, these effects. So, um, yeah, so I think what we've done is to run, um, to check on the quantiles, which we are using as uh, our micro, and then to weight these regressions using um, um, employment weights uh, to get to the macro. So essentially we are moving from uh, showing how, moving from an aggregation uh, to, from at the micro level, so at the individual establishment of firm, if you aggregate it to the macro level, uh, which is the region, how the coefficient of density varies and what the effect of weighting is in terms of uh, that movement between the two. Okay, so in terms of the data sets, which is um, something that, you know, like I said, has uh, taken much of the time, we have assembled uh, three data sets and we have merged three data sets. The first one that we're using is the business structure database. So this is a snapshot of, uh, of the IDBR that is made available to, uh, to researchers and it is managed by the ONS. So ideally this contains about 99% of the economic activity in terms of uh, uh, firms. And from this data set, what we get is employment. So when we import this, we, we're working in the HMRC data lab, when we import this data set, the variable that we are using from the, um, from the um, BSD is employment. But it also has details on the firms at the postcode level. So we are able to use that information and marry it uh, using the ONS postcode directory to create the regions that we are using. The next one is the, the VAT returns panel. So this is from uh, the HMRC, and it essentially registers all firms really. Uh, it has all firms that are registered uh, for VAT. And the firm identifier here is uh, the VRN unknown. I should have said that in the BSD, we have NTREF, which we are using as uh, the firm identifier. And then the final date, from here we have inputs and outputs, so we're using uh, sales and intermediates, uh, which we're getting from uh, the, uh, the VAT. And then the final data set is FAME, so this is also uh, from the Bureau of Andac. We also imported this into the HMRC uh, data lab, and FAME gives us uh, a measure of capital stock, so we are using uh, tangible fixed assets from FAME as a measure of, uh, of capital stock. And I must say that FAME also has information on um, things like uh, output and inputs, but because these are small firms and they are under no obligation to report that, it's not really well represented in, uh, in the data set. So the only variable that you know, is, is well uh, re represented is, uh, uh, is uh, tangible fixed assets that we are using. So we merge these data sets. The HMRC were kind enough to give us uh, um, a table across, a, a lookup table that had all these three identifiers that we then used uh, to match them and create, uh, um, create a data set. And our firm is now defined on the basis of matching these three identifiers. So it was for most of the firms, a one-to-one -one match, but you can also imagine but that for some others, it was more like a many-to-many -many merger because you have one firm which has an NTREF identifier in the BSD, but it has multiple VAT uh, registrations. Okay? And the same thing, you have one firm that has one VAT identifier, but it, it has multiple uh, BSD uh, NTREF identifiers. So it was really a question of looping around and uh, trying to come up with uh, a definition of a firm, especially for those. And in terms of uh, the spatial analysis, which was our interest, um, we have used uh, travel to work areas. We were able to, like I said, because we had data up to a postcode level, and when we used the ONS postcode directory, we were able to match uh, to travel to work areas. It didn't make sense, any economic sense, to undertake the analysis at the postcode level. So we aggregated to, uh, to the travel uh, to work areas, and our focus, uh, at the moment, at least in this analysis, has been on a single travel to work area firms, essentially because it makes our life easier in a way, because these are firms that we could 
I allocate to a single uh, travel to work area and then we can easily attribute productivity to that. But some of the work that we've uh, tried to extend in showing is to look at uh, multiple travel to work area firms and the picture is essentially the same whether we look at multiple uh, travel to work area firms or single uh, travel to work area firms. And we've also taken out uh, finance and insurance sectors so that does not, uh, is not covered in, uh, in our analysis. So from the firms that we have, the single TTW firms, well, we're covering about 97% of the vast majority of the firms uh, in the data set. So again, this speaks to the majority of the firms uh, in the data set are fairly small, okay? And they account for 43% of, uh, of the entire uh, employment. So essentially, if we exclude the uh, multi travel to work area firms, I think we're losing about 57% of the uh, employment, which is quite substantial. So we're still trying to see how we can uh, work around that. All right, in terms of the estimation, really, again, uh, we are just uh, using, uh, estimating a production function and a Cope Douglas production function. We have uh, implemented the Woodridge IV procedure, but we have also provided results on the basis of uh, OLS. They're not very different. Uh, we don't really get much differences in terms of the coefficients of K, L, and M. And one thing that we also do is to look at markups. So we want to see if firms were able to return to uh, profitability or if firms are still struggling post the financial crisis. And we measure, uh, we measure markups as price over marginal cost and we uh, use uh, the coefficient of uh, intermediates because this is assumed to be a cost-free adjustment input. So we simply calculate it as the coefficient of the elasticity of um, uh, output with respect to intermediates and we take a ratio of that to the share of uh, intermediates in total uh, output. And well, the other things that we do, we use deflators, so we are using real uh, variables. And the, the deflators that we're using, uh, we're doing double deflation uh, from ONS. So for the uh, output, we're using the experimental, uh, experimental output indices. And we constructed intermediate outputs, I think after an exchange with a number of people, including Josh. Uh, intermediate outputs, we are using the supply and use tables. And for capital stock, we also created uh, capital stock indices from the uh, current prices and the chain volume uh, measures. And well, some of it is really just a uh, cleaning and we're saying that we've used uh, a second order polynomial. Really, essentially, this was just to smooth revenue and purge it of any uh, measurement uh, error. And we classed our standard errors at, uh, at the firm level. In terms of um, the summary stats, really, just to see that you know the average of the revenue for the firms in this data set is about 4.3 million, and the intermediates is 3.2 million, and capital is 2.4 million. Okay, and when you look at the standard deviation, you can see that it's you know it's pretty much high, about two magnitudes above the mean. So you can see that there's a fair representation of really big firms because it's, um, uh, and we break it down to see the P5 and the P95, so the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile, and you can see the differences from there. For example, if you look at, uh, say, capital, you see that the, the biggest firm, the average for the biggest firms is 664, a thousand, but it's just 1,200 uh, for the smaller firms. And again, this is below the, uh, the average for the sample, which is 2.4. Again, speaking to saying that there's more, um, a lot of, a uh, small number of very big firms and a big number of uh, small firms within uh, the data set. And um, just in terms of the, the numbers, really, so the firm coverage from when we merge these three data sets um, is ranges from about you know, 650 to 800,000. This is after the cleaning, but ideally it's close to a million firms that we have access to uh, in this uh, data set. And the employment is almost about 18 million that is covered. So you can see that in terms of the coverage and you know, the scope, it's much, much bigger or much better than the 
uh, annual business survey or the ARDX that you know we traditionally use for uh, these kinds of analysis. And just some evolution of um, uh, labor productivity, uh, which the first one we're calling apparent labor productivity is simply output per worker. And then the second one is GVA uh, per worker. And this is the output from the OLS regression, and that's the Woolridge procedure, and then markups. So what we actually see is that you know there has been in, in terms of the period of the financial crisis, which was our area of focus when we first started this work, is to see that you know the TFP, whether we measure it as the Woodbridge or the OLS, was you know just slightly and briefly affected by the financial crisis. But that cannot necessarily be is not necessarily the same for uh, labour productivity, whether it's output per worker or GVA per worker, and also markups. So we see that in now. Oh, sorry. Firms have actually, you know, returned to profitability, and you know the recovery was perhaps from around, sorry, around uh, 2016, uh, and same thing around 2015, 2016 for uh, labour productivity. And when we break this down into single travel to work area firms that are smaller, we actually see that they have not their um, their labour productivity has not recovered even until 2017. But also just to say that as of last week, we got an uh, approval to extend this data to 2021. So hopefully in the next coming months, we can then uh, extend the analysis until 2021. It hasn't been a small feat. All right, and the other thing, okay, the spatial analysis. So now we wanted to see uh, this thing that we're saying from the micro, when we look at the analysis at uh, the, the firm level, and then when we aggregate it to a uh, regional level. So in terms of the regions, we are using the travel uh, to work areas, so the 228 uh, travel to work areas within the UK. So we estimate a regression where we are taking a demand uh, TFP as a function of density, and then we add in uh, regional and uh, time dummies. So our coefficients uh, of interest is gamma, which is the coefficient of density, and uh, the, the regional uh, dummies. Okay, so this is uh, the output of the regression, and in terms of the weighted regression, we can see that the coefficient of gamma that we get fairly is within what the literature postulates as uh, within the range of the uh, productivity return with respect to, uh, to density. And the unweighted one is, uh, is fairly small. So we're using the same data set, only that the other one is, you know, we're weighting and aggregating to the regional level, whereas the other one is at the firm or establishment level. And this is something that we wanted to uh, explore and uh, see why we are picking up uh, these differences. And in terms of the regions, so London is uh, the base category. And as you can see, even beyond density, we see that there's still a productivity gap in terms of uh, the regions. So the coefficients are all uh, negative with respect to, uh, to London. So if we, just to break it down, so we're saying that, okay, the productivity is negative with respect to density, but actually when you also look at the weighting, if you look at the uh, unweighted one, okay, the, for the unweighted productivity, you get a coefficient of say 12.4. If you just take Bunbury as the median for the East Midlands and compare that to London. So when you look at the weighted and unweighted, you see that the weights alone account for about 75% of the difference between uh, these two regions. Okay. So we, we tried to also break it down to see, just to look at some correlations between firm size and uh, productivity and density within, within that. So what we actually pick up from here is that there is a positive correlation between firm size and productivity, but this correlation, these two jointly, are not positively correlated with the density of, uh, of a region. And this is something that we want to try uh, and, and pick going forward. Because what we see is that when we break it down to the deciles, we see that there is a positive return 
uh, in terms of uh, big firms, there's a positive return to density for uh, big firms, but that's not the picture that we're getting when we aggregate it uh, here. Okay, I think this is what I was saying. Yeah, so uh, just to conclude, well, I guess the big thing is that we have assembled this data set Okay, for now is only from 2004 to 2017, but obviously going forward, we have until 2021, and we have enough to calculate or to estimate a TFP using this longitudinal data set, and we can also do some disaggregations and look at um, you know, things from a very granular uh, point of view. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, jo Josh Martin, Bank of England. Th thanks so much, uh, Bridget. That was that was great, and uh, really pleased to see how this work has evolved since since the last time I I saw it. Um, and and some of you, I think last time some of your aggregate trends looked a bit uh, a bit wonky. They look much better now. Um, you were saying something at the end about um, firm size and density and productivity. I'm really sorry, I just didn't follow that. Could you could you try that again for me? Uh, I'm probably just a bit slow on the uptake. Uh, is it no, that no. the effect of density varies by firm size? Is that what I was? No, 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 no. We're saying that if in if in a dense area, there's um, it's characterized by a high correlation between firm size and firm productivity. You expect that there is going to be a high uh, productivity when you aggregate in the end. But what we actually see is that there is a positive correlation, yes, between firm size and firm productivity. But this correlation together is not positively correlated to the density of a region. And this is the negative graph I was trying to show. Can I ask? <laughs> Sort of not about this, but you mentioned that you were also doing this in France as well. Um, whether there were similarities between the UK and France, whether you'd seen signs of this. I mean, I, I'm wondering about countries which are highly centralised and have a thing like possibly a London or a Paris, and I know relative to a country like say Germany which I also know where things are a lot more decentralized and possibly but I don't know about the United States where it might be different I don't know whether you can comment upon that but it kind of is a question which is raised and you kind of indicated that you might have done something somewhere else as well yeah we there isn't a big Paris gap, that's the thing that comes out, is not as big as the London gap. That's the, the thing that I can say off the top of my head. Well, unfortunately, in this data, we don't have any data on skills. Yeah. It, it, it just, uh, I wouldn't say that, but perhaps I don't know <laughs> if we could use the occupation categories as an a proxy for skills and explore that and see if this is really just an issue of skills or there is something that we're picking up. But it's something that we can explore. Just a small point. Um, so different regions will have intensity in certain sectors. So can you take that into account and see whether the industry composition of the area might affect your results? What we're trying to do now is just that I didn't give a picture of us how we're going forward, but we're also doing this kind of analysis at the sectoral level, so within sectors in a region to see whether you know, there's different industry compositions that are driving the picture that we're getting. But at the moment, we don't have those results yet. Yeah.
thank you for a, a really nice paper and the data set sounds incredible and amazing. I was wondering whether you might, might in this analysis, integrate something about land or, 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 or the, the land asset as well as, I mean, plant, and, I think you've, you, it seemed like you had plant and machinery, but whether there's something about uh, the spatial part and relative prices of land. Okay, I think it's, like I said, I think these are things that we can incorporate as we go forward because we're just trying to explore, like now we are at the exploration stage of the data set and incorporating anything, so yeah. And for now, the sectors that we broke down are really you know, like macro sectors, so land is one aspect that we have, but I can't really recall the results that we, we've gotten on that one. Uh, so, uh, in the spirit of future work, uh, the, the markup stuff is really interesting, and I know it wasn't focus of the second part of the presentation. But have you got uh, plans to do more work in that area? Like, it'd be really interesting for the current policy issues. You know, how how do markups respond to input price shocks? <laughs> what what do those dynamics look like? Y you could do really cool stuff because you've got a lot of cross sectional variation here. Yeah. That, uh, to identify those dynamics, I think it'd be really interesting. Okay. Sure, the Bank of England would be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Uh, and uh, so, um, here's Bridget. Um, and uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Uh, again, thank you to all the authors, uh, and I close the session. Thanks very much.